after he first said yes, then said no. A fictional conversation with one of the most feared and misunderstood cult figures in modern cinema, with contributors played by actors and a script based on real interviews with the legendary Vincent Gallo. You know what? The best interview of Vincent Gallo was done by Vincent Gallo. The best articles about Vincent Gallo were written by Vincent Gallo. The best acting performance of Vincent Gallo was directed and edited by Vincent Gallo from a screenplay written by Dun 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 Vincent Gallo. So, you see, this is painful for me. You know, I'm, I'm better off interviewing myself. Imagine getting to interview myself. I'd be so excited. I'd poop my pants. You're kind of a legend, but no one knows what you do. What do you actually do, Vincent? What do you mean, what do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm a freaking genius. That's what I do. I write and direct great films, and I'm loved and hated for it. You know, Buffalo 66, with its raw, naive quality, you know, what critics call its flat, lo-fi feel. It's been called the best independent film of the last decade. What are you doing? What are you doing? What? Don't touch me. So why is there a black hole here, where a clip of your new movie, Brown Bunny, should be? a film that caused the biggest upset in Cannes Film Festival history. Because critics said that it was the worst film ever made. So I've hidden it. No one, and I mean no one, gets to see it till I've recut it. So who are the 48 people who should be dead in Hollywood? Yeah, like, I'm going to tell you that right now. I thought we were here to talk about me. Why should we care about you? People think I'm a crazy, self-obsessed nut job, but I'm not. I'm a serious musician with the biggest collection of gear in the Western Hemisphere. I've also been a model and a successful painter. Plus, I will never, ever appear in a magazine unless I can be on the cover. I am, let's be honest one minute, Vincent Gallo. THE Vincent Gallo. Do you have hobbies, Vincent? I hear you're obsessed with the color brown. I sure do like brown. And pink. Pink and brown. If I had to choose, pink would lose. I also like remote airplanes. I'm obsessed with aquariums. I have 35 aquariums. And at home, I have only the finest things. Linen sheets and cashmere covers. I'm, I'm a perfectionist, even in household appliances and cleaning products. I cook and clean like a Sicilian immigrant. You're a motorcycle champion too, is that right? I race fast and smooth. I have 88 trophies. So where do you come from, Vincent? I was born in 1962 and raised in Buffalo, New York State. An unpleasant, snowbound, nowhere place. Once a year, Buffalo gets to appear on the news when some hapless man gets stuck in a drift. Cut off and buried since Friday by snow drifting up to 30 feet. I've had a lot of cute girls there, though. My mother ran a beauty salon that was in the storefront of our house. My father, who didn't seem to want a job, was stuck with me and dragged me seven days a week to various racetracks within driving distance of Buffalo. And boy, was it fun. I got, I got to starve all day long and finally maybe got a, a hot dog and a cup of warm water while watching my father lose my mother's hard-earned pay. Do you have brothers or sisters? I have an elder brother. He is ugly, but for my mother, he is the most beautiful man in the world. My youngest sister works in a pizza restaurant, and they all live in Buffalo from where they will never move. This is the voice of my mother. God forgive her. Even as a baby, I guess I overlooked Vincent because he had a strong personality. With Charles, his brother, if I gave him a cookie and put him on a blanket, he'd sit there for hours. If I did that with Vincent, he'd look at me, mash the cookie, then go off and jam his fingers in an electrical socket. Being a genius, I imagine you felt stifled by Buffalo. Let me tell you a story. One day, I took a trip alone on my bicycle, real row far, around five neighborhoods away, to a part of Buffalo called the Fruit Belt. Street names had fruit names, you know, like Banana Street. Let's just say, in this neighborhood, there were more than a handful of blacks. I actually, I think I was the only whitey there that day. So I got mugged, 
beaten down and robbed of the only nickel in my pocket by black kids, I was six. When I got home, my father beat me up. He said, why didn't I bring them home to rob the whole house, too? It's a good story, but it's fiction, isn't it? Is it that you don't like blacks, Vincent? I'm a Republican and a law-abiding citizen. I'm not a racist. You look a little Jewish. Are you Jewish, Vincent? No, I do not have the Jew gene. So what should we talk about, Vincent? There's no agenda here. Let's talk about what a wonderful president George Bush has been so far. Let's talk about how ridiculous handicap parking is. Let's talk about why the Puerto Ricans think they need to have a parade down Fifth Avenue, or the gays for that matter, too. Let's talk about revenge. No, let's talk about your father, who you claim said you were nothing but a bum, and you'd always be a bum. There wasn't a day when he didn't hit me, punish me, yell at me, or tell me something I did was wrong. I was grounded once for a year for raising the heater thermostat from 38 to 41 degrees. Hello? You seem to make a lot of your father's alleged abuse, Vincent. There doesn't seem to be any evidence, except for maybe he was a bit grumpy sometimes. It was a dysfunctional household. You can see that for yourself in Buffalo 66. The atmosphere was permanently bad. Said it's your son. Yeah, in the film, and also in interviews, you portrayed your mother as cold-hearted and unloving. I totally forgiven my parents for all of that. I have no more resentments or angers. I understand now that they did the best they could, that they're God's children. You want to understand me? Let me tell you another story. I was seven years old, and me and my cousins go hunting in the woods with some kitty bows and arrows, except we've removed the suction cups, filed the ends to make real pointy hunter's arrows. I'm crawling to the grass, and I spot a baby robin bird. I trapped the bird in a shoebox. I put the box on the ground, and I made a deal with God. The deal was, I'd shoot one arrow in the box. If I hit the bird, I'd get to tell my friends that I'd shot it. If I missed, then I would take care of the bird, love it and pet it and get worms for it forever. So I shot an arrow in the box and right away I got excited. Sure that I'd miss and now I'd have a pet bird. I pulled on the arrow and lifted the shoebox lid. And what I found was that the arrow had gone right through the back of the bird and the bird's mouth was wide open dead in pain, really looking at me, I mean, really looking at me. I didn't tell my friends anything, I just made a cross, and I started to cry. I had bad dreams for a long time, and I never shot at anything else again. That's very moving, Vince. Damn right it is. So what you're saying is that you're hurting inside, but after the bird died, you couldn't trust anyone ever again. That's right. The only person I could trust as a kid was Richard Nixon. You claim you met him when you were six. It was the proudest moment of my life. I was in awe of Richard Nixon. How can anyone be in awe of Richard Nixon? Nixon was holding back the chaos. He was a good guy. No one respects that, just as no one respects the people who fought in Vietnam and subsequent wars. You ask me why I admire Richard Nixon, that's why. Apart from Richard Nixon, you don't trust or love anyone, do you? No. Why? Because people are all creepy. Creepy, creepy, creeps creeping around, creeping here, creeping there, creeping everywhere, creepity, crappity, creepies. Who are the creepiest? Who are the 48 people who should be dead in Hollywood? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Well, Tim Roth, that no-talent mini-dwarf Brit. Bill and Hillary Clinton and their ugly, orphan-like daughter, Chelsea. John Kennedy Jr., ugh, that cadaver, that son of a philanderer. Jefferson, what a hack from Dazed and Confused magazine and his partner, Kate Moss. There's some creepy losers right there, huh? Is there anyone you like at all? The wonderful and classy hero, Ronald Reagan. Anyone else? The beautiful and innocent Angela Morosky from Pittston, Philadelphia. The only girl I've ever loved who I haven't seen since I was 11 years old. If anyone knows her, tell her I still love her. What are your first sexual memories? When I was 12, I was a compulsive masturbator. I used my mother's hand lotion. I was up to about 10 times a day, and I started to need help. You were arrested for flashing, is that right? I became obsessed with flashing once I discovered the technique. I got caught when a cop car pulled up and I confessed. I had a lot of things happen to me like this when I was a kid. I had bad luck. 
So at 16, you decide to move to New York City and everything's in place. The sex drive, the high cheekbones, the right-wing politics. That's right. And upon arrival, I was so embarrassed about being from Buffalo. I immediately learned Italian so I could pretend I was from Italy. But you're living hand to mouth in New York. I'm living floor to mouth, picking up $5 bills off the dance floor at Studio 54 with a tiny torchlight, ones that had been discarded by coke snorting queens. And selling your body to these queens. I hustled for tricks on 53rd Street and danced in a gay burlesque club in Times Square. I liked gays, so I exploited my sexual appeal. I must make it clear at this point that I'm not gay. Never have been, never will be. You certainly look pretty gay. No, no, I look Sicilian. But I tell you this, if I was gay, I would have made one of the great gays of all time. But you're obsessed by the word faggot. I call everyone a faggot. Faggot this, faggot that, I don't mean anything by it. Not gay in any way? Not even a little bit? No, sir. You know how it is if you put some things off. They get worse and worse. The same applies if you don't get your tax return in and anything you owe by January the 31st. You'll get hit by a hundred pound penalty plus interest. So don't ignore it. Self-assessment. Tax doesn't have to be taxing. The less you pay for your holiday, the more you can spend on holiday. With nothing to pay until March and free insurance on summer holidays. You'll get more for your lolly at Lamp Ollie. Eleven strangers share a deadly secret. What happened to the motel? People started dying. Identity. There was a storm and we couldn't get out. We couldn't get out. Take home the movie critics say is truly scary and will haunt you for days on a disc packed with special features. <laughs> Identity on DVD for Monday. I got this job carrying packages on planes. So my first airplane ride is to Europe. I was 17. I'm scared of flying, so to calm me down, this asshole gives me a joint to smoke on the plane. I smoked pot twice in my life. Pot is bad. I don't like it. I don't like pot people. It's evil. And when I take over the world, the first thing I'll do is put all the pot smokers in a room and tape them together. Anyway, I went to the bathroom and I lit up the joint. In minutes, I'm freaking out. That was the worst flight of my miserable life. Pot people and planes all going to France. Four wrongs don't make a right, right? You hate the French too, don't you, Vincent? I hate Europe. I had my mental breakdown in Paris. Paris is the best place in the world to have the worst time of your life. I'm the guy that people used to say, we so European. I don't relate to those monkeys. Legend has it that you spray painted your name all over New York in a bid for stardom. It's a complete lie. Nevertheless, your name appeared suddenly all over New York City. I can't help if I instill such devotion in my admirers. What was an ordinary Vincent day? Every day was an insane nervous breakdown day. I, I came to New York to be a legend, and I'm working my butt off to become a legend. I, I was hanging out in places like the Mud Club, part of the new wave scene. I meet Jean-Michel Basquiat, one of the most talented, charming, charismatic, clever, bright, irresponsible, self-centered, self-indulgent monsters that I've ever met. We start an art rock band together, The Legendary Grey. We did a famous gig at the Mud Club. After that show, we broke up. It was Jean's fault. Anyway, a month later, he was a millionaire art star. Well, sometimes it's good to be black. And you're still a messenger boy, waiting to get famous. One day, I deliver a package to LA. 
but this trip changes my life. I go to Muscle Beach because I heard it was cool. When I'm swimming in my 1920s bathing suit, a bunch of surfer jerks steal my shoes, my keys, and all my money. It takes me eight hours to hitchhike back to the hotel. I meet this groovy, cute, weird chick who takes me to the movies at night where I see Pasolini's Salo. It was showing it with a softcore gay porn film. But this girl was hip enough to know that the Pasolini part of the bill was special. And it changed my life. It was such a heavy experience, I can't explain. It was a very good film. You decide to become an actor, and you get some TV parts playing tough guys in shows like The Equalizer. Truth be told, you were pretty wooden, weren't you? You were so bad, it was lucky someone was on hand to put you out of your misery. Come on, man. Come on, man. What the whole idea of having to act is too gruesome. It's too ambitious for me. I wanted to be a movie star. Glow like a ray of light is around me. A kind of Jesus. Where were you living at this time? I lived with William Burroughs. That's ludicrous. You lived with William Burroughs? Correct. I made mad music, and Burroughs loved music. After I moved out, I would send him experimental tapes, and he would send me a postcard. Look at how perfect the postmark is from 1983. Do you think David Arquette or Ben Stiller has a postcard from Burroughs with a picture of himself on it where he writes, Dear Vincent Gallo, thank you for the tape, which I'm listening to at this moment. All the best for 83 and forever. William S. Burroughs. Do you think David Arquette or Ben Stiller have one? I don't think so. Let me love you. Meanwhile, I'm getting streets. So what's up? What's your name? Moni. My name's Prince Vince. Let me love you. Come on. Let me love you. Let me Vincent Gallo turns Puerto Rican and becomes a world-class leader in the hip-hop scene. You were a pretty fly dancer, weren't you, Vincent? As we can see from your bizarre appearance on Graffiti Rock. Hip-hop and you don't stop. I never had a career, planned anything. Maybe you were beginning to realize that you were a more interesting work of art than anything you could do. You could turn your life into a work of fiction, a myth, as you've demonstrated so well in this interview. You say you never had a career, Vincent, but it's a lie, isn't it? Oh, really? It's a lie, is it? So in 1991, I, Vincent Gallo, turned down Quentin Tarantino for the role of Mr. Pink in Reservoir Dogs. Why? It's my big break in the movies, and I blow it, man. Come on, what happened? If, if, if I control my career like some evil, cunning genius, how come I didn't take that role? Maybe you didn't get the part. Did you not get it, Vincent? No, I'll tell you why. Tarantino is garbage. His work is not art, but garbage only. I am an artist. The kind of artist that appears in an ironic lesbian serial killer road movie like Confessions of a Trick Baby. I'm, I'm, I'm great in that. Hamming it up as a Mexican transvestite. I have lived 1,000 centuries. And I will live 1,000 more. So bad, I'm fabulous. It's a cult role. Vincent goes Rocky Horror. In 1998, you made your directorial debut with Buffalo 66, which is an autobiographical film about growing up in Buffalo. I wanted to show people where I grew up and how goddamn awful and boring it was, how studying the dirt on a bus window was the highlight of my life. I wasn't going to direct it, but the director I had didn't work out. I never wanted to direct. It's just the most horrible thing in the world. Plus, I'm very vindictive and unforgiving and punishing. It was horrible. You cast a smoldering, kooky Christina Ritchie as your girlfriend. I went to see the Adams Family with this girl that I'm screwing, and as soon as Christina Ritchie comes on the screen, I'm so mesmerized and in love. Her face, the way she performs, it's so strange and understated and perfect, basically. She was always my first choice. Your character was horrible to her, and you were the same on the set. She had the habit of being late. So to break her off the habit, I asked her to make a list of the nicest members of the crew. And every day she was late, I threatened to fire one of them. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! In the film, your character appears to take pleasure in hurting her. You don't know what it's like. You should have seen these guys, actors. 
Just as they should have stopped Hitler and Austria when they had a chance, I should have stopped these ten Hitlers I had on my set. Like who? You don't want some pop? Angelica Houston, the great Angelica Houston. God forbid she should have a job where she has to work. Would you like some ginger ale, honey? I, I got some ginger ale. Come on, Angelica Houston is one of the most professional, committed, and respected actresses in Hollywood. Her portrayal of your mother, as you saw her, was effortless. We paid her a quarter of a million for three days, and she refuses to work Easter Sunday. I read that she agreed to rehearse, but she was bending over backwards to accommodate your schedule. Right, so, so that's why we're forced to film an exterior shot. And there's this blizzard storm of rain and snow, and I'm filming and I'm dying. I mean, my life is over. My film is ruined, I'm screwed, and all because of Angelica Houston. She's on my 48. Oh, come on, the film is a big success. Critics hail Angelica Houston's performance as great, and you premiere it in your hometown of Buffalo. I spent the day on this weird picnic with my family, and my cousin says, if he'd made that film about my parents, I would have punched his lights out. And your mom and dad? My dad says, Vincent did very well in it. My mom said, I don't think Angelica Houston added anything to the film. It was a good day. So you were disappointed when the movie didn't make Can, I imagine. It's the most disappointing feeling I've ever had, and it put me in a bad mood, worse than I've ever been in my whole career. I was really hurt. And it failed to get into Sundance either, too. One of the judges, Paul Schrader, vetoed its inclusion. He's that half-man who wrote a couple of scripts for Scorsese. The things are okay after Buffalo 66. It's a big success, for Christ's sakes. Not to brag, but I made a masterpiece. I'm a brilliant director, but that's beside the point. The film is better than me. No, uh, things went wrong in my personal life. In 1999, my psychiatrist died. A very good doctor named Malcolm Hill. I've not been doing very well since. The smartest guy in the world, Malcolm Hill. I saw him for about 12 years. I called his office one day and there was an announcement uh, on his answering machine <laughs> notifying everybody that he passed away. I never felt such a loss from anyone's death in my life. No one else's death could feel that bad to me. Vincent Gallo's new movie, Brown Bunny, has scandalized the Cannes Film Festival with its graphic oral sex scene between Gallo and Chloe Savini. Critic Roger Ebert has called it the worst film ever seen at Cannes. Hit that switch, switch, switch. We saw the footage of you at the premiere and you looked pretty nervous and depressed. Chloe Sivigny seemed pretty worried as well. Were you anticipating a hostile reception to the film? Understand this. I've been making Brown Bunny for three years. This is my triumphant follow-up to Buffalo 66. I bring it to Cannes myself, fly over to Europe with the damn cans of film. I want to do everything myself so nothing goes wrong. But it does go wrong, doesn't it, Vincent? Everyone hates the film, utterly hates it. People are booing and laughing in the aisles, and it's been reported that you burst out crying at the press conference, saying it was a disaster and a waste of time, and you were sorry you'd ever made it. I never apologize for anything in my life. I like the movie, and if I didn't like it, I would have changed it. The only thing I'm sorry about is putting a curse on the critic, Roger Ebert's colon. You know what he said? Yeah, I gave Gallo's film a thumbs down, and when I had my last colonoscopy, they let me watch my colon on a little TV, and it was far more entertaining than Brown Bunny. Roger Ebert is a fat pig with the physique of a slave trader. You tell that ham hawk I also put a curse on Gene Siskel, his partner, who died of complications from a brain tumor in 1999. <laughs> Wouldn't you say that all the bad press for Brown Bunny has just been payback for a lifetime of negativity? Bad karma for the 40 years of vitriol you've poured on the world? You just don't get it, do you? I'm a satirist. I satirize the idea of celebrity and success simply by trying to be a celebrity and trying to be a success. And this negativity and vitriol is an energy. It's what everybody feels about the world, but no one has the guts to say out loud. You're a difficult man, Vincent. I can hardly say it's been a pleasure talking to you. But you're direct, I'll give you that. That's very profound. So what next, Vincent? What's next is that I'm going to make you number 49 on my list of people who should be dead in Hollywood. The 
Art Shores back Friday at 7.30. Next on four, the search for a rite of passage leads to fasting and circumcision. Abe's manhood. Ouch.